Well, hello, everyone, and glad you could join us today. Um, if you're here for Sunberg Farrar's webinar, You the Farm, We the Garden, then you've come to the right place. I'm Linnea here, and... And this is Jeevak. Good morning, everybody. And well, good morning. And today, we'll be going through some of the benefits of an independent industrial design studio together and sharing how it can add meaningful value to your product market success. So first of all, to all of you who are jumping in with us today, thank you for choosing to spend this hour with us. We also feel the pain of having very busy schedules, so we're really glad to see all of you here, and let's try to have some fun together. And especially today. today being a beautiful day outside, at least here in Detroit, yeah. thank you for being inside in your office or cubicle, but <laughs> we will surely have fun. Exactly. So my name is Linnea, as I said, and I'm an industrial designer, and my role here at Sunberg Farrar is marketing and communications design. So I'll be the one helping with Q&A today, so you'll hear from me as we go. And we absolutely love to talk and interact with you throughout our time, and we love to hear your thoughts. So please shoot us comments and questions in the Q&A, and we want to make this a design conversation, so we'll pause for questions as we go. And I just wanted to add a note for all of you guys that um, when we go live here in a second, Jivak is going to share his webcam, and it'll appear on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, I know some of you would prefer to just see the slides or just see the video. And not see me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this ugly mug over here. Yeah. No, no, he's, he's beautiful. Um, <laughs> so, um, so there is a slider between where the webcam will be and where the slides will be that you can click and drag back and forth to enlarge or um, diminish the size of the webcam. So just so you know, you can view this any way you want. And for those of you who may not know, uh, Sunberg Farrar, we are a full service product innovation studio based in the Detroit area for over 85 years. And throughout our legacy, we've been supporting clients across the product and mobility industries through human centric design, which Jivak will share more about in a minute. Yep. So Jivak is also an industrial designer. And if he were a superhero, besides being a designer, because all designers are superheroes, um, his superpower would be being everywhere at once. And I'm not joking, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> So here at Sunberg Farrar, he is our energetic, passionate, and curious director of strategic growth. And with his unique blend of education and experience in industrial design, engineering, and business, he is a rallying voice for the alignment and optimal inclusion of the end user's unmet needs and unspoken wants in the core value proposition of a company's product and service portfolio. And he helps companies understand the fundamental role of industrial design thinking to generate thought after shareholder value. Jivak has more than 23 years of professional de design experience, first in India for seven years at Tata Motors, and then in the U.S. for 16 years at GM Design, uh, and now at Sunberg Farrar. Beyond that, Jivak is also on the board of prominent design associations and think tanks like the Michigan Design Council, Ether Design Group, and the Detroit Creative Corridor. He also served on IDSA's international board for six years and chaired IDSA's 2017 flagship international design conference, Design is Business. So obviously, Jivak also has copious amounts of leftover time after all of this, and he can also be found indulging his love of kickboxing, obstacle course running, or photogra photographing birds in obscure parts of the world. So Jivak, I think you were recently <laughs> in Costa Rica just doing that, right? Just a month ago. Yeah. Um, so we're about to get started here, but while we're still just waiting for everyone to get logged in, we have a couple of icebreaker questions to just get us limbered up here. So get your mouse clicking finger ready and we'll go with the first one here. So speaking of superheroes, if you could be any Avengers character, which would you be? So go ahead and click on the answer that best describes you. And uh, we personally think that this question is very revealing about a person, so choose wisely. <laughs> um, and we'll see what kind of an audience we have here today. Now, Jivak and I can't vote, but Jivak, what do you think? Oh, I, I exactly know who I am in that area, or who I want to be in that area. But I think myself and you, we cannot vote. So let's see what the other Avengers, and we are assuming you are all Avengers. We are not talking about DC right now. Maybe for the next webinar, we can. All right. We'll leave that up for a couple more seconds and see who voted. All right. Let's see who, let's see what we've got here. Who is the most popular? All right. 
So we've got a tie between Loki and Doctor Strange. Awesome. Interesting. That's, that's pretty interesting. All right. Let's try it. Let's do one more here and then we'll We have started. some protagonists. We have some antagonists. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Like I said, this reveals a lot about it. Right. Within these, I would go with Doctor Strange. Though I would have gone with Thor. Yeah. But that's okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, question number two. Uh, since the first day of summer was just last week, in case any of you missed it, we're asking, what is your favorite classic summer activity? <clears throat> so go ahead and click on what answer you prefer to do in the summer. Any thoughts on this one, Jivak? Oh, yeah. I, I'm all in, not glamping, but camping for sure. Campfire in camping. I personally, so I grew up doing a lot of water skiing and water sports growing up. So boating would be my go-to favorite. Boating and sailing. Wow. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll finish up this poll here. And we've got campfire and boating and sailing. Okay. So that's awesome. You have a buddy, I have a buddy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have 50% here, 50% there. That's All right. good. All right, cool. Well, it looks like we're getting a good crowd of people signing in now. So welcome to those of you who are just joining us. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Jivak here and we will get started. So. Awesome. Thank you again for your patience and uh, at least trying to see how many Avengers we have uh, on the field right now. Uh, so once again, uh, welcome to Sunbrook for our uh, our second uh, I would say uh, iteration of uh, webinar series as such. Today, I think uh, our, our let's say the theme is you the farm, we the garden, and literally uh, in a single kind of an I would say uh, uh, justification of what the entire uh, summary should be or has to be. I think I need to just click that. I will just first close this. Yeah. So it's in a way, in a nutshell, and we will try to elaborate that or try to put some evidence or confidence behind that is we, when I say we, it's a design studio. Uh, it's an uh, internal or external design studio. And we can again uh, try to look at that labyrinth also. In the garden area, the mindsets are a little bit different. You have to make sure you are pushing and pulling, tweaking and tinkering uh, and hacking things together, trying to align different dots, not just have an assortment of dots, but connecting different dots. And that's what typically, if you are a backyard gardener or if you are really a quintessential gardener, that's where you see all the crafting happening from this idea over here beyond, I would say, the fringes of any area. But in the farm, once that sapling is done, once we know exactly what we want to have from that fruit or plant uh, or flora, fauna, depends on how we are use the analogy, then we go into the farm mode or the business mode where you have one idea, you are then manufacturing it at in economies of scale. It might be a software, it might be an experience, it might be a service, it might be a product. But the definitive element is the mindsets required in both the elements are not complementary. And that's, we will try to see how much the, there is an overlap and how much there might not be an overlap. So let's hold our thought over there on the entire premise of what we are going to talk about today. But I see some of you and most, some of you actually, I, I can see the list uh, who have uh, jumped on the call. Some of you are designers, some of you are design studios. Good to have you. Maybe at the end or maybe by email, let me know if you can add to this. So together as design studios, independent design studios, we can try to uh, bolster uh, and try to see how we can set up the entire evolution of the design world. But again, trying to uh, answer uh, some of the intriguing questions that some of you uh, might be having, which I see might not be in the design world. A little bit, I would say, uh, at a explanation of what we do uh, in, in this world. So uh, once again, I think it might not be over here, but I will come over here. Uh, what does a design studio do or what we do, what we do as such? We are firm believers that anything you see, it might be a service, object, wizard, it might be a gadget, it might be utensil, it might be an equipment, implement, can be a little bit more better, can be a little bit more beautiful. And that has always been the scenario uh, for our studio. By the way, I think as Lanea mentioned, this is our 85th year uh, being in continuous operation as a consulting studio. We uh, are right now the second longest standing independent studio in the nation. But since then, 
everyday objects of use, right? It might be a waffle maker, coffee maker, that's a 1955 Packard all the way in the back. Since then, we have been involved in design of physical, tangible, durable products and services, packaging and, and, and so on and so forth. That was then. Today also, we quintessentially do the same things. The context has changed. It's more colorful, more fun to be in the studio, but we still do the same things. We have our own focus group clinics. We have our own dedicated research facility inside the studio. We understand and absorb the elements needed uh, from the market. We also have half of our studio is a physical prototyping model making shop. We do not manufacture, uh, we are not a manufacturing contracting company, but whatever we do has to be feasible, right? So we make sure not only in the design world or research world or innovation strategy world, finally deliverable has to be all those emotional things plus a feasible manufacturable object. So we are joined at the hip in being a designers and engineers in, under the same roof and we make sure we extend that uh, in that particular area. And some of you might have jumped on our website, but typically this is what we typically do day, day in and day out. Objects of everyday use might be a shower head, might be your big appliances, small appliances, uh, might be the toothbrush uh, in your bathroom. Uh, the medical product world is pretty strong and we do a lot in that area. Endoscopy tools, open heart surgery tools, heart lung machine elements. And we can talk maybe at some other webinar about the exact purpose of what does beauty mean. Nobody is going to buy the Terumo machine because it looks, let's say, beautiful, even though it may or may not be. The VBL is there definitely to make sure it belongs to the family. But the way we define beauty is different in different categories, and that would be a completely different topic. Maybe we can put that as our topic number three uh, a couple of months down the line. But we talked about everyday products. We are talking about medical products and also mobility, right? We happen to be in Detroit, and right now the entire universe is colliding in the world of mobility small to big transit tractors everybody wants to make sure they put a very good value proposition forward by injecting in all the ai or mass learning or sensorification and connectivity happening over there so that's what typically we do uh, we start with let's say sketches and ideations uh, and we start before that too but typically people assume we just start from over here but yes we definitely do beautiful design whatever we do always happens to be beautiful but we start with solving the right problems beautifully and the process is amazingly similar to let's say right now what you see in the screen sketches renderings 3d modeling CAD understanding studio engineering parts of it building prototypes physical prototypes proof of concepts finally they're available in the market to sell similar processes for product design uh, similar things you might see most of us are familiar with this and today we are not going to go into the process of that element but once you do the design then you do engineering part of it we have amazing engineers on staff we take care of that maybe i will try to rush a little bit more uh, and we can try to go and try to talk about the element uh, today in, in the main elements as such so yeah we do graphic user interface a big part of ux by the way ux is user experience GUI just happens to be one element of it. It's not the entirety of it. That's again a different subject too. Uh, talking about packaging, no matter what, it has to be packaged better to communicate it. We will talk about this a little bit later about the feature scenarios, painting the future, ideal user experiences, all in the emotional, aspirational, experiential world. How to build those or imagine those, or anticipate those, and then come down to the everyday things of, okay, this is what we're going to do in that kind of an context. So we can talk more about those things too, you know, if, we, if we want to. And that's typically, I think I will just stop over there for, for a little bit, uh, again, to recover. But that's what typically a design studio does. Any independent design studio would be doing uh, similar things, uh, depends on in, in what kind of a temperament or, or robustness everybody is offering. But that's what a design studio would do, internal or external assets, right? So that's, uh, let's say for, uh, that kind of a group right now on the webinar who might or might not have been exposed to the world of a design studio. But that's done. We are not going to talk about the process today. We are trying to talk about the main element, you the farm, we the garden. And let's try to talk about the elements in those things, right? It's basically the entire thing is the business mindset is required to make sure once you have your idea, keep on minting them. Literally minting is the word, minting them on your production lines and then making sure uh, you uh, reap the advantage uh, in, in the financial world too. And whereas in the garden world, we talked about the creative mindset, which exponentially is way different from how you would approach uh, the business mindset. It is not just the classical 
I would say the functional and rational or beauty or standard and form and function is not necessarily that kind of a classification. So the thing is, in the creative world, you will start with a completely different vantage point, right? I Means I am an industrial designer myself. Uh, by the way, I still go uh, uh, across uh, in the dark area. Uh, I went, I did my executive MBA from Michigan State uh, University. So when you do that, predominantly, when you look at the left, the farm forces, when you look at the way, let's say, a business person might slice and dice everything, they also have a peculiar way of slicing and dicing, let's say, a concept. For them, a concept is not a physical mock-up, but a different a business model concept. They do, uh, I would say, look at plenty of vantage points, but predominantly it might go something with four to five forces, and there are a couple of other folks uh, that uh, are the proponents of different areas. But it all comes down with the threat of new entrants, substitutes, supplier, buyer. It's, again, apart from that, it's always forecasting. That essentially means you are, in a way, trying to judge, predict, assume what's happened going to be in the future based on the statistical thinking of data of what's happening right now. It is still extrapolation uh, on, of the market. Whereas on the garden side, let's say on, on the design studio side, it's all the emotional forces, right? The starting point of any good design firm, and there are so many around, is always trying to understand what is that culture, the context, the beauty, the behavior, the value, not just the intrinsic value, but the instrumental value. So even though the value is one from the stakeholders, from let's say the business world, the value that we would see would be completely different in how to make sure that final product in your bathroom or in your kitchen or in the operation theater, how it is useful, how it is usable, how it is ergonomically defined to fit uh, that kind of an, I would say, mesomorph or an exomorph. And then at, the, at last, how it's going to be aesthetically good or prudent to be in that kind of an, I would say, ecosystem. So we all need both the elements, but maybe we need more of this thinking, let's say this, uh, five forces of four to thinking in, in, let's say, when you're in the farm world rather than in, in the garden world. Even we always say we start with design as needed. Before that, we make sure we indulge into robust design research, qualitative and quantitative. But before that, we make sure we understand the innovation strategy, right? Corporate strategy is one that might come from the uh, from the companies, uh, from, from the clients. But we make sure we understand that and we blend in the innovation strategy. We actually call it Genesis inside our studio as such. But when we start with a strategic mindset, there is a strategy block on the client side, strategy block on our side. But the way even you start asking the questions, right, those are completely different. Like in the farm mode, in the business world, you might say, I need this. In the garden world, we might say, I want this, right? Over there, uh, let's say on the dark side again, it's a good to have dark side too. You might always start with saying like, how much does this cost? But when we want to really do an ideal user experience, people will have to think or we want them to think, where can I go and get more money for it? The money is always available, discretionary income. Or depends on how you want to use it. If somebody wants to just go with this functional things, like, is it in stock? No, it is where you create that much kind of an, I would say, pull of the product uh, and experience in the market that people have to say, I will find it somewhere if it's not on Amazon, that's not going to happen. If it's not in, uh, let's say, Best Buy or something else. So even the way we look at things is different, right? What I can do other things in my life without, and I want to go and buy this thousand uh, dollar iPhone, right? It all starts with that. Like at that time, if you just go with the market in saying, as compared to the others, if you are trying to benchmark or peg the bestness of your product in the category, is that a word bestness? That is, wow, it I did not know that. It is now, yep, we are going to invent some new words. How do you stack up? If you just do a product that's quintessentially incrementally better than one of your competitor, you still have to ask the question, let's say in, let's say garden world, in, is it also the right thing to do it or it is still the best as compared to anybody else? So there are just the way of approach of how you try to slice the element is completely different, right? Prudent versus cool. There is so much of a vast abyss between those these things, but we need most of them. But we need to have this mindset when you're at the start of the genesis of the project as such, right? And all depends on again. So this is basically how you start to look at the farm versus garden principle as such. But before that, I think we need to look at two other things before we try to formulate something else or try to bring out something else. And that one is the progressive nature of any business. If you right now, right now to look at the business world and it's each and everybody has their own kind of a system to look at it, it's very difficult to categorize them into steps as such. But 
if you look from the principle of how you are going to use industrial design as a part of it, there are some companies seriously in this day and world, they're blatantly unaware about industrial design. It happens each and not each and every day, each and every month. Okay, there are some companies, they are one step higher, that they know they have bumped up into an in, bumped up, bumped into an industrial designer at a cocktail party, but they still intently choose to ignore to use it in that kind of process. Predominantly, uh, it just keeps on going like, like, hey, we are just in a functional part of the industry. We are just doing saw horses or we are doing uh, some other tools over there. Why would people think about, let's say, beauty? Because I think we need to, we need to really talk about, uh, I would say, uh, the world of beauty because beauty is not just a shiny object, but we can come back over there. Then the third category, I would say, in the progressiveness is, oh, we want to experiment it. We want to do it. I know I met a designer or a studio, we want to do it, but they do it at the end of the process. Uh, uh, they do it at the end of the process. They try to add it as a part of a decoration uh, or a part of, uh, let's say, adding on, on the tail end of it. It's still okay, it's marginally good, but as designers, we need to be there in the architectural, architectural framing of the problem rather than at the end just to quintessentially, as they say, adding lipstick on the pig. So that should not be the way, but at least they want to do an experiment that's good enough. They will come back and say, we went to the market, we still got some feedback. Can you do something still sort of facial skin level on it? Anybody or we should be doing that. Then it comes into the decoration element. We talked about that. Then some, there are some uh, uh, businesses who would literally use ID as we would want it, right? As the design studio card out in the in the entire pie chart of the business. They might having their own design department. They might not be having design department, but they use ID as one more department, just as you have an HR department, IT department, legal department, ID is there. It might be small, it might not be super used, but there is a good kind of an affinity to make sure they use it and designers have some say. But the last, if not the least element is where businesses are using ID as a strategic function of the entire strategy, right? And that's the way the progress you. Eventually, each one of you might want to see where does their company stop or stand or, or is on the transition on, on one cusp or another. It's beautiful to see how a handful of, not handful, hundred full of companies on the Fortune 1000 are using ID as a strategic function. And that's the way typically you would want to do, do that as such. By the way, we are design studios. I am a designer. I would be biased with ID. ID is sure short thing to be a part of the entire strategy function. But again, a big, big disclaimer, ID is not the only thing. We have to make sure we understand the world of technology and the world of business and nowadays the world of sustainability also. So it's not saying that ID is the only thing needed, but ID is surely one of the most invaluable ingredient into the entire strategic function too. So we understood, let's say, right now we're trying to look at the way the businesses are molded, but we also have to understood on the same note what will happen happens in the world of uh, the products as such, right? The products will be uh, literally, uh, it might be an incremental product design, it might be a boundary level product design, or it might be radical ones too. So it all depends on where is right now the maturity of the company as such for that company category. And then in the product world, which product are we doing, right? Not everything we talked about design or research or strategy needs to be done for incremental one. That's where you do it faster, better, cheaper, a little bit smarter, all those day and day, every day, those things as such. And there is a specific element where you would be using that predominantly. Then the boundary level one, like line extensions, model year to model year changes. Uh, let's say if somebody says something in the market, you show them and up one ante kind of an element and the radical transformational one where you have to really go uh, and change and own the category or define a category or try to make a substantial move to increase or leverage your business. So this is from the product perspective. And again, product is an object. It can be service. It can be an experience. It, it, it's it, basically anything that you eventually want to sell as a value. And earlier on, we saw the progression of businesses. Now let's see how design studios independent right now from my perspective or our perspective how they blend in so we talk about any company uh, any corporation let's say tomorrow somebody wants to start a corporation if you go back to the genesis of any big corporation it might be 3m or anybody else it all starts with an with a, with a uh, with couple of individuals who have that kind of an passion to change the world. So the first stage always is a startup kind of anything, right? And I did not go with the entire list down, maybe they're hidden also, but typically that's the area where 
we have to understand there is no money because it, they might be raising money from their own kind of sources or family money or maybe money they must have uh, got from the last business. But the startup mentality is one. Then let's say they do the startup mentality. They have this kind of an uh, MVP, minimum viable uh, kind of a product process experience. Then they go to the next world of evolution and that is the little bit established. Like now we understand we have this product. Uh, we know we have to keep on tempering and changing it a little bit here and there, but it's established. They, they own it. It might be three or four years in making. But then they try to come to the next stage of vertical expansion, right? Like, okay, now we have this product. Now we want to do the portfolio, right? I think we all know the profits are made from a portfolio, not just one product. So now it's very area to be really, I would say, the mature, mature state of expansion where you are vertically expanding in that area, in that category. And the last one is you are successful in number three and now you want to go into the adjacent markets. You are an ecosystem, right? You Let's say you are doing uh, a toaster uh, in an Americana kitchen. You are in that world. Now you suddenly look at the coffee making machine or you look at the way uh, the, uh, the kitchen uh, cabinets are making. You know that world because essentially if you do design research of what you do in stage number three, you essentially are gathering information of the entire ecosystem around. And we might come back to the ecosystem word uh, later, I think. But the thing is, no product can be designed in isolation, right? You have to understand what the ecosystem is. And that's why it becomes really important. So in, in those areas, uh, we can we uh, literally can uh, try to add up where would be the good use of an uh, industrial uh, design studio. Uh, so before that, I think we might be looking at uh, some of the questions. Yeah, is there so a question? We did just get Whoa, a okay, okay, good. question from Maya. She asked, uh, in the startup stage, um, does Sunberg for our help clients build a business model around their idea or do we have to come with a pre-established model? Beautiful. Uh, perfect, perfect. Uh, uh, I would say, uh, timing too. And thank you for raising the hand. By the way, uh, I think most of us are conversant with raising the hand uh, and writing a question. Feel free to uh, shoot questions. It will be good to have a conversation as, as Lanaya was saying in the, in the earlier. So startup phase is pretty kind of an, I would say, delicate stage also. Uh, no money is one thing, uh, but there is still some money and then it again comes back to the right use of money. Let's uh, talk about that later too. But uh, yes and no. Uh, the yes and no is typically a product would always be successful in the market and one of the ingredients is making sure it has a backup business plan to it. So when we start with uh, startup, uh, startup companies, by the way, we work with OEMs, we work with tier ones, medium sized companies and startups too. It, that, that doesn't matter. It matters the impact of design. That's where we come in as true uh, uh, designers as such. So we will sit together. We'll try to make sure we ask most of the questions in the business world to make sure there is a proper founding and foundation of what needs to happen because we can come in and in a way we can get, uh, we can use the budget you have for innovation and use it, but you need to make sure that you need to have the budgets for the next stages to make sure it brings it to the market. It's, it will not be, uh, right to just use the money for design and, and not have any money for you to go to the market at least. So at the startup stage, it's nice to have the business model ready uh, or set up. We love to work with those kind of and setups, but sometimes it's not there. Uh, sometimes a pure inventor with a pure, pure idea, then maybe we might uh, extend them to the, let's say we are in Detroit, Michigan. We have an amazing incubation stage uh, kind of an, uh, development activities uh, in downtown. We might then hand them over or introduce them to the other people in the business world where they help them make their own business case. They might spend a few months or half a year over there. And then typically they'll come back to us and saying, okay, now we got that thing done and we can do it. Most of the, I would say, uh, government agencies in any big city do it at a very, very, very subsidized stage. And that's perfectly good uh, in the startup world. But sometimes if uh, I would say you need expressly services of helping us in the innovation strategy, uh, we also help that in that area. But typically, it typically happens to be uh, between stage number two and three. Uh, that's where we have seen the most, I would say, uh, use of where we stand uh, in that kind of environment. So that was a good question and keep on uh, letting me know when the questions are getting asked. Actually, that really helps in uh, explaining how if this is, let's say, the first phase of evolution, there might be more, there might be less. Uh, I'm just trying to make it uh, easy for explanation. In the startup world, uh, typically uh, the person uh, falls in love with his idea 
they might have a kind of an, uh, a widget or something running, but they have to use it to make sure they get all the framework done. So that's maybe at that time, uh, the chances of using a mature design studio to help might, might not be needed. And I, I'm saying in an inventor world, when you say startup, uh, stage A or stage B uh, in the VC kind of an uh, venturership, that's the world where an independent design studio will come in. So in, I should, I, maybe I should add a stage zero of, of inventors over there, which will be difficult uh, to, uh, I would say uh, get some traction, but over here we can still uh, do uh, help a lot. In stage number two, that's where I think uh, some companies, most companies, try to establish their own kind of a design cell. A few designers, uh, as such, and they try to make sure they mature that first product. So that's the area where we see, let's say, less traction. Uh, typically, as an independent design studio, uh, to go and help in that area because that's their area. They know how to manufacture. They know the technologies. They know the business plan, and they want to own the part of it through the design. I would say ideation uh, and creation head. And that's perfectly understandable. Now, the, the greatest expansion happens in stage number three, where okay, now we know what this gadget is in this ecosystem. Now we want to go and own the entire portfolio. Of, of vertically expanding in that particular area. That's where typically we see more traction coming back to us and saying, okay, guys, you are there. We also have our team. Can you work with our team to go and uh, to this, let, let's say the portfolio expansion. And the best part, and that's where I think uh, would be uh, the design and design research area. The earlier one would be more design. Before that would be more innovation startup. But coming back and completing the loop in stage number four, when the companies really establish they dominate an area, 40%, 50% of the market, and now they have their eyes on the adjacent uh, markets as such. That's when we come back uh, with the innovation strategy kind of and service as such. So it will still be at the end, uh, we will isolate uh, or try to make sure we understand innovation pathways uh, and try to understand what areas to go. There are millions and millions, seriously, or maybe in the words of Carl Sagan, billions and billions, uh, he always negated that, uh, needs in, in the market. Which ones of those to identify and which one of those to solve? That predominantly happens in the ecosystem level element. And that's where typically we would come with, uh, let's say, offer out that we see our traction over there with innovation strategy, design research, and industrial design. So it all depends on how the maturity level comes in uh, as such in that particular area. Uh, and that's where we would try to say uh, that's when the more traction of a design studio, independent design studio, uh, if they want to outsource, would, would finally or completely happen over there. At this stage, we should always look at the next two things, and that is the stage of the reality and the stage of the real need in the market. So if you are a corporation, and it looks like some of you are from pretty big billion dollars or beyond corporations uh, making on the list of who is right now signed in in the webinar. So uh, most of you are familiar with, let's say, MOIs, model year, model year 2019, 2020, 2021, you have this kind of a calendar year kind of a plan. We are here with our list of different products. These are different SKUs. We will do this, this, this element as such. So those things are pretty much uh, over there. And most of the companies would have their ID or sometimes their advanced ID department in the company too. The element that we see of concern is, or concern or basically uh, the reason why uh, still uh, studios like that come to us is, that advanced ID uh, is joined at the hip to this calendar year to year kind of a process. Every company will have their global uh, product development process, right? It's good to have that kind of a stage gate process to be used on the farm side. But then the mindset that you might be having on this model year to year things should not seep into the advanced studio thinking as such. But by the mechanism of a bigger corporation, or let's say of any corporation, or any company, or any firm, it becomes uh, aligned uh, with what's going to happen next year, and next year, and next year. So most of the resources get aligned with making sure we want to solve the problems today, tomorrow, next year, and next year. On the other side is, uh, the actual need is you might need to have your independent design studio. Again, that can be an skunk works inside the corporation too. Some com companies do that. I'm not negating that. But the typical need in the market would be or where we see ourselves more applicable and more useful uh, or people uh, find use for us is having that independent design mind asset, uh, mindset where you go with no previous propensities for any uh, additions to any technology or business kind of and models. You go out open fundamentally in the market. You do proper qualitative design research of that space rather than asking questions in, in your object world or technology world. So you try to understand what are the newer needs and wants and desires and dreams 
uh, and anticipated dreams in that area as such. So when you try to go without any, as a third, uh, I would say, uh, uh, party as such, without any any brand also uh, at stake, you really try to get uh, unearthed and discover and I would say extract those kind of an unspoken, unarticulated, latent uh, uh, needs. And then you can try to say, okay, now that's how we are going to converge on diverge out to the market, use the filters both, uh, I would say, uh, in the emotional world and in the business world to make sure like out of this plethora of different billions of needs, these are the ones we are going to solve because somehow they are aligned to our core competencies of our business. That's where the business uh, uh, play comes in too. And then again, you let's you, you converge it to make sure we are going to do these parts. So the need is the one below. It can, uh, so in a way, any independent studio like us, uh, I, I'm not saying it's just us, can really fulfill that need. And glory to you uh, as a company or a firm if you already have this completely distinct, inert, no reporting system back to uh, any manufacturing or engineering world inside your company, then literally, as I said, glory to you. That's, that's probably the most ideal thing, but somehow it's not uh, seen in that numbers right now uh, in, in, the, uh, in the, I would say, the firms around as such. So that's, that's where how the, uh, the top level is literally how right now most of the things are aligned. The bottom one is typically what is the need if we talk with this uh, innovation strategy people from uh, or uh, personnel from any company uh, or, or the marketing uh, teams also or maybe the strategy guys or the executive leaders they finally want to have to do something which is completely new and different to the market right because all the everything else the durability the uh, the craftsmanship even the design cleverness intuitiveness uh, the elegance all those will be given by any good studio how do you go over and above in not an ordinary but an extraordinary experience, right? Extraordinary defines by the same is extra. It's out of the ordinary. The top level is ordinary because that's how you see, uh, what is the term? You can't see the, the tree through the forest or the forest through the tree, right? That's how it happens. You just, just by the nature of us being humans, we try to go into that functional fixation, that myopic vision of this is where I am. It is very difficult to step outside those everyday elements of, uh, of of those field in saying now we can go unbiased uh, in the market and see what really people need. It is uh, highly impossible just for the human brain as such. Uh, and uh, that's the one of the areas where uh, people find the need of an independent design for, for uh, more, more unique. Another point is design of an object is always going to reflect what's in the pop culture around us. Right? We always uh, always know this. Uh, George Nelson from Herman Miller always uh, espoused this idea. It's always what's around you in the cultural societal sense that you have to understand and then make sure what you reflect. You have to call, watch for all the noise in the refraction too. But we understand this and that's why the product, any product, as I said, a good product cannot be designed in isolation. You have to understand the ecosystem. So when you say the ecosystem, not just the ecosystem of a kitchen or an, uh, your garage uh, or an operation theater, but ecosystem at large. Because no matter what, the interaction is going to be at the center between product and user. But And that's where the intersection of the human-centric design, right? One human, one machine, and what they're going to get from each other. At the end, at the boundary, it is the collectiveness of humanity, right? Those societal, cultural elements. Those are the ones that really mold the industry. So we have to understand what are those macroscopic, uh, I would say, vectors. Not just the trends. Trends is one element, but what are those subcultural elements happening and how those things are molded out. And for that, you have to be actively being, working in those kind of uh, elements too. So right in the center, I'm just going near it, uh, you are... That's, I should not do that. Right in the center is the category where the company, the firm, uh, the client would be really good at. They might not need us. They should not need us. They know they own that element. But now when you go into the stage four area where they want to go and conquer more markets, they want to dominate more world, uh, maybe um, create more uh, stakeholder value, essentially more money also, you have to understand what are the nodes in the society and cultural things. And they should not be just, I would say, theoretical and academic kind of things. They have to be real world things. And that's where Somehow an independent studio like us is completely aligned, right? Each and every day, each and every project is different. At the same time in the company, we might be, we are working with housewares, we are working with lawn and uh, garden right now. Transportation is always there. The smartness uh, of an, I would say, a kitchen or an OR is always there. We are always working with all these categories, if not all the companies all the time. That will be too much of a good problem to have. But we. But essentially what we do, the diversification of our portfolio happens because that's how we go out and seek business. So that's how companies seek us. So uh, going, going back on screen, 
this thing is a part it's a side effect that you will want to do it in any any studio as such but it always happens it's always happening 24 by 7 365 days a year maybe maybe beyond because on the weekends too we're always involving into some elements that are our passion points and we're trying to learn uh, i think it's a curse of a designer uh, as such like not just me a, any good designer right means we just can't help but being curious about what's happening in that area so literally 25 by 7 is not a not a stretch by any means again depending upon your passionate uh, passion for that industry uh, and your world too but we definitely cross pollinate across the categories and that's why i think that if you want to emerge and expand in an area depending upon what stage you are in the market that's where we will be i would say uh, again i'm biased will be might be more useful and you can leverage us more in bringing that kind of a mature thinking in the elements because when you go back to the definition of a good product design and we did cover that in our last uh, webinar about what is and definition of a successful product right and it can go from success comes at the last end it all stems from the principles you have uh, and the ethos you have as a company one thing is out very clear in the market is everybody typically for all good reasons try to solve for their categories but we have found out in the market is how how you try to abolish or extinguish all the pain points in the intersection of categories one category to another category as such right and that's why you have to little bit step back and literally stepping back and look at the entire ideal user experience journey in that ecosystem you have to make sure you understand that and then look at the category it's outside in not inside out and that's how uh, uh, coming back to the elements are uh, elements of uh, happens within let's say an internet design studio is you are by the virtue of what you are doing uh, caught up in the myopic version which is really good to solve uh, in let's say uh, we talked about the product evolution also the incremental and the boundary level may not be in in the last uh, level as such uh, so that's why uh, one of the reason is the reason for our existence as an independent design studio is to make sure you go and solve the end user or being a real citizen of the country rather than just being a consumer of your category that's a huge difference you want to look at the same person from and nowadays we hear the customer uh, centricity more than human centricity which essentially rigs up to being we are only looking at our customer rather than the people who came to let's say our shop or our uh, retail center and did not buy our products so when you look at literally the citizens finally we understand we have to define it uh, for the a persona that we want to design but it still still has to understand the entire category and somehow we look at that in 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 a, in a lot area i think we still have if uh, 10 minutes or so at least to talk with before we can maybe take another question uh, so try to put it in a, let's say a a diagram if we may want to call so let's say the company you are on the top level there the company as such you might have your internal staff as a design studio or finally an external studio uh, studio as such so external studio also can be a corporate studio which typically is a part of a management consultancy or manufacturing or it depending upon their business model right or an independent studio like us but within us also i would say an independent studio you might want to go to a specialist or a generalist and there are reasons sometimes you may want to go to a specialist uh, but there are again looking at the cadence and the portfolio expansion of where you want to be within some portfolio there would be a need uh, for a generalist also where you can bring in all this cross referencing that happens in different categories because our users are everywhere they are not just going to use uh, let's say only your appliance and nothing else in the world they are getting i think uh, the ideal user experiences get set in outside your category and that's why i think uh, and I'm, we are uh, a little bit biased here generalist very really is more useful because we try to make sure we understand how are those anticipations and expectations happening everywhere and then condensed down to your category rather than in out it's outside in as such so uh, in that area sometimes i think people also ask like hey uh, what is the essential difference between those things and one of the analogy i would like to uh, propose is uh, uh, it's basically i uh, by the way uh, lani i did not mention but i love to cook also i'm just a cook i'm not a chef but the difference between me as a cook and a chef is vastly different I means yeah a cook with a good commercial kitchen and an exact flow of all the ideal things happening can bang you out a nice dish that happens in a michelin star one two three star each and every day but it still depends highly on a process which is depending on plenty of elements brought to the surface you assume you know 
all the answers, all the obstacles, all the constraints as such. That hardly happens in the real world, right? Not every time you have the entire budget or big budget or small budget, you have a time, the trade show is coming, you want to show something. That competition has shown something else in, uh, in that particular show. You only have nine months to go for the next show. There's so many missing elements in the element. And that's where a true chef comes in, right? I mean, sometimes you just walk in a meeting and say, guys, we only have three months and this is the only budget we have. A pure answer of the chef will be, okay, we can make worth the use of time and budget you have and use it more meaningfully, which will be well worth it for its next step. Would it be the ideal eight course menu? No, because not all the things are in the flow. But then the chefs will come in and say, okay, now within the ingredients we have in this uh, everyday kitchen, I can mix it them, I can spice it at them to be very useful for the next course. And you go for the first course, the second course, the third course, and time builds the confidence level, not only client and our relationship, but the client and the market relationships as such. And the essential reason again is, we're always at the drawing board. Means normally when you hear uh, on the media typically like, that puts people running back to the drawing boards. That might happen at some other kind of, and I would say, architecture. Never in the case of independent design studio. 24 by 7, we are typically always at the drawing board. That is, I think, that is the occupational, not the hazard, but the occupational advantage of our business, right? We are always colliding. It's always a collective wisdom in the studio, right? Somebody is working with an shoemaker. Somebody is working with an backpack maker. Somebody is working with a... Uh, uh, appliance or tools or gadgets, we make sure we, we never share secrets between uh, companies, that's for sure, but we always are influenced by each other's ideas and inspirations because design research, even though it can be used as valuation at the, at the, at the tail end, is a highly amazing thing to be used at the earlier end. And when we say we share ideas, not just in the, in the world of black and white sketches or something, but it's always, we, these are, we call these uh, 3D sketches. We're always experimenting, always hacking, always role playing, always putting things together uh, as such uh, in, in the world of, I would say, uh, low precious, uh, low fidelity kind of models as such. And, and another thing is, and that's why I think I'm going back and forth uh, in, in the slides, another thing that becomes very essential when I showed you that kind of an, uh, a concept diagram is the world of the future, right? We're always talking about uh, the world of the future where it can be possible, can be plausible, probable, that is, I wish I would, I wish I could, and all those elements. But the element about the future is, right now we, uh, as a studio, are always happy uh, and maybe uh, more lucky to be working with all these future studios of all these categories. It's, it's amazing that we are, in a way, uh, living in 5 or 10 or 15 years kind of a time horizon. You're living those things, you're understanding the different extensions and the anticipations in those worlds. And then you come back to ground reality and generate your own future. Those the quintessential side effects are, I would say, uh, become uh, the more primary effects of why and what we do uh, in, in, in the real world. And maybe I'd like to uh, pause here sometime or stop here sometime and try to get a couple of more questions. The questions are still coming in as such. But that's essentially, uh, I, would, I would say, uh, the world of how we try to look at the future scenarios but coming down uh, to the best element is how you make sure, no matter what, you use an external design studio, a generalist, or your own internal staff. Finally, we all know your product, it might, again, the product can be your service, your experience, your packaging, your kiosk, your sales booth, your properties uh, for the next trade show has to be the honest container of your brand promise. You cannot just promise that we are going to solve these kind of problems. Your product has to stand on its own, understanding how it's going to be used or misused in the more product and then deliver that value each and every time, each and every day in the backyard, in the garage, in the bathroom, in the kitchen at, at every time. So maybe I can uh, pause over here and I think Lanea is prompting me that there are a couple of more questions happening over there. We still have, we still have, uh, let's say, 12 minutes to go uh, mm -hmm. as such. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. So we have one question from Keith. Um, and Shivak, you were talking about um, not being myopic, but seeing the forest. Um, and he says, regarding not being myopic, how do you know when you've nailed it down? How do you know you found the answer to a design problem in a finished product? I like that. Wow. How do you know? How do you know when you nail it down? How do you know when to stop? And that's 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 pretty amazing. Uh, it's it's very hard as designers. Uh, we are all uh, let's say handicapped that we can always keep on exploring, right? But I think maybe, uh, maybe that's a loaded question. That's the way uh, 
that's one of the reason uh, where we can contain a design project, right? We can always keep on exploring, but we have to stop somewhere. And somehow uh, charting out a design proposal and saying, okay, these are the few months in front of us. This is where we start the area of divergence. This is the day we stop because we just can keep on exploring. And we know when to stop. So we understand that kind of an area because that's how we, uh, that's our business model is. We write fixed proposals and we send it to you and we can look at them. You can look at them and say, okay, now we exactly know when you can stop. But the question was, how to nail, how do you know when it nail it down? Classic question. It all depends on the projects, but typically we really indulge into robust design research area. We have our own design research studio and our design research team. So when we do research uh, as such, it's we try to take the subjectivity, objectivity out. We have to make sure we want to design and, emote, uh, and design a successful product. So when we design a product, let's say there are 50 sketches on the wall. It's not me or David or Greg going to choose the final concept. Uh, it's basically choose, get chosen by the persona that we extracted from design research. Don't fabricate your persona. That's an amazing thing we see in the market. So when we extract it against a persona, the persona uh, depends again on both the rigorousness level you are going to use a person to define their cognitive ability, uh, their look towards the future, their value structure. It depends on the maturity uh, and and the and the complexness of the persona. By the way, complexness is good. Complicated is bad. Uh, once you decide the persona, let the persona decide which are the elements that you want to choose, and that takes the that makes sure that when the persona's needs are there, very well laid out in the front starting of the process, you have your hypothesis. Then you do the design research, do your uh, innovation pathways, realize it, go back again with the second uh, phase of design uh, research to validation uh, as such. And once you go and meet with the same team or the persona and they say, this is what we were really looking out for, then I think we know when you nailed it. Rather than uh, just the exhaustion of time or exhaustion of money or, or, or exhaustion of any other uh, burden that might be. That's a great question. Great, thank you. Anything um, more? We still have time. Yes, we have another question from Hans um, talking about uh, cross-category pollination. Um, it says, you talk about your process being very integrated. Does this integrated approach save you from doing as much iteration, or do you also iterate, and which is more important? Interesting. Yes, de definitely. It means uh, iteration is, an, is one of the, I would say, constituents or ingredients of the definition of industrial design. It will always be iterative process. It will be, I would say, impossible to just start with one sketch and that will be your final design through through all the processes as such. So by, by I would say, by the uh, definition of it, it would be iteration. But the question was, if we are, or we are claiming to be making sure that we can get the collective wisdom of the categories already in, then how it can be, uh, let's say, uh, I would say, short fused, or can we have some, uh, efficiency over there. So the answer is still yes. So it would be iterations. I said that. But then uh, if that's the way uh, we want to proceed and uh, chart out the process, absolutely. Uh, if you, let's say not everybody would have uh, design budgets or time to go to five different markets and do three, uh, let's say design uh, research focus groups in those five markets. It takes time. It's good to do that. Uh, but it takes time and money. Uh, but then instead of that, if you want to use a collective wisdom, uh, if and also it happens to be an everyday product. If that was a, a specific product for a medical world in a specific lab, maybe this approach might not be there. But if it is an, uh, let's say, an, a hair dryer or a vacuum cleaner or a lawnmower, where uh, we would say that we are using it each and every day and we happen to represent the market, if that was designed for Japan, uh, maybe not. But if it's going to be designed for, let's say, North American market, maybe US and Canada, maybe yes. So. Uh, I hate to answer the question, it all depends, but it depends on the context, what stage of the firm you're looking at, what is going to be worth to you, and how fast or, or, or how, how soon you might want something in the hand. So uh, we can do it. It, can, it will be, uh, let's say, a little bit shorter than the ideal uh, user experience as such. Anything more? We can take a couple of more. Sure. Uh, we have there another. More. There are many. Yeah, wow. we have another one from Bill. Before we go there, feel free to, uh, apart from, I think we only have, let's say, six minutes more. Uh, but I see there are many, let's say, OEMs kind of and, uh, things on the uh, on the list and also some other design studios too. It's good to have you there, but I have missed anything or you want to add something more. This is not comprehensive again, uh, but shoot me an email, call me. Uh, our mobile phone numbers are right over there. Uh, we would love to talk more about uh, what anything else can be added or taken out from the deck. So feel free to uh, help me out over here in this kind of a quest of, of, of design studios going into the future. 
Um, so Bill is asking, are there activities in the design process that must be done together between, uh, say, a company and an independent industrial design studio? Can a company completely hand over a product to an independent design studio? Can you repeat the first line again? Yes. Are there activities in the design process that must be done together? Yes. Uh, so the last part, I think, I should answer that. Typically, as a design studio, we firmly believe in, in collaboration, participatory design, especially with the client and the stakeholders. That, that always keeps the project real. Means we are all born from artists, but we are not doing artists itself. We are doing actual applicable products which bring value back to the stakeholders. So we will genuinely want you to be a part of the entire process. So we would always try to plan the workshops or, or decision making things along with you. That's how we will make sure there is plenty of, I would say, confidence from your business side or financial side to make that decisions as such. Uh, the earlier one, I would say, can we completely rely on you? So we we do that, but it always happens for companies whom we have had a very decent long tenure of working. So if we have worked with the company and with the team for a few projects, uh, you kind of understand the principles, uh, the value structure, the, uh, the manifesto, the ethos of the of, of that kind of a culture as such. So you can try to make sure you you suppose you can suppose pretty well, you can assume pretty well, and say okay, out of this seven kind of an uh, let's say final that elements, uh, I think uh, I think uh, Mr. X Y Z, you can go with this, this, and this. So if there is a continuity of process, yes, it can be done little bit offhand if that's that's the reason you're coming to us because you have no time. But if you are trying to have this as a first or the second kind of an engagement with us, we will really, really want to make sure not only your team, but your core team to be completely uh, on the process. And actually, it's, it's okay for you to learn what we do. Uh, and you can then perhaps you engage us on the, on the last area of the radical design as such. And then you can transfer the same learning uh, internally with your staff uh, on, the, on the other stages uh, before that too. That's completely okay. In fact, the more together we learn, the more we would like to share what we do, uh, uh, and we will love doing that. And I think that's another reason why companies also try to seek us out. Anything more we can do? At least one more. Okay. Should we? Last last question. We still have. Before I will try to. I will try to answer it pretty fast. Okay. So we have uh, the last question. We're going to take is from Shira. She says, "You have been in this domain for more than eight decades. How do you see the world evolving in terms of the business and role of a design consultancy, and where do you see it going?" Oh. That might be uh, that might be a completely uh, <laughs> heavy topic to uh, answer. Uh, definitely, yeah, means uh, the studio. Uh, I have been in business only for the last 23 years. The studio, as you said, is for the last 85 years. There's an amazing long uh, kind of a trail uh, of of things going wrong, things going right. What are the best practices that come on into into that? Uh, the evolution of design studios, as such, I think that's a pretty heavy question uh, as such uh, to, to take as such right now in the last two minutes. But I think there'll always be, uh, there'll always be reason for anybody uh, to uh, go out and hire a generalist independent design studio versus uh, a very good reason to uh, do it in-house. It all depends again on what aspects you are and how it will go. Uh, but creativity is such an amazing element. Uh, it has to be taken care of internally too. Uh, you have to always be in the in the mix, uh, and that might be very difficult. I think uh, depending on some OEMs to keep on doing, making sure their designers are always exposed to these newer things. Like just a matter of fact, because of who we are and what we do, we just have to be at the CES. We have to be at IDSA conferences. We have to be at DMI conferences. That's the hardware show, software. There's so many elements, and that's where you start to soak in those things. So uh, by the by the reason of being an independent design studio, we have to make sure we are always trying to uh, I would say argue uh, in, in a good way what's needed, what's not needed, what is frivolous, what is really meaningful. So that thing is always happening, and then uh, a company can in a way uh, take a piggy ride uh, for us uh, for a few months or, or or a half a year on that, and then it's going to be beneficial for both of us. By the way, that's a good question. Maybe we might want to do. Uh, the full place topic or maybe on that sometime. Yeah, and Shira, if you want to send us an email, we'd be happy to talk more about it. Yep, we have a load too. Well, we're at the time, the end of our time together today, so thank you, Jivak, and thank you guys all again for hanging out with us today. Um, we will send out a recording of this webinar along with uh, our contact information in case you have any more questions. 
And we would, as GVEC said, we would love to hear from you what you'd most like to cover in our next design discussion. So please shoot us an email. Um, our next webinar in our 2019 series will be coming soon. And as you probably know by now, GVEC loves to talk. <laughs> so we're looking forward to <laughs> chatting, chatting with you again. And stay tuned because we'll be posting the details for the next one soon. So GVEC, anything else before we close? No, I think it's a beautiful day. Go out and enjoy there now after, after being inside. I will probably do the same, uh, but stay, stay tuned. Uh, we will try to announce our uh, next uh, webinar topic uh, pretty soon, and we will make sure you will uh, get the uh, note of that. Uh, and we will try to jump again uh, together and have this maybe next time a little bit more conversational way. I love the questions, by the way. So thank you again for uh, all the folks who did send in the questions. It, it helps it make more, more, more interesting too. Thank you. Over and out.